Have you ever wondered why Bernoulli and Venturi are so popular and you can't even go near an airport without hearing their names? Um, no. Me neither, but what they did discover is key to understanding how a plane flies. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the second class in the Principles of Flight series. Today we're looking at how the air flows and how the way it flows is used to make aerodynamic forces. In motorsport, they use these aerodynamic forces to create downforce, but in aviation we invert that and we use it to create lift. Now, this class is quite a large one with some difficult physics concepts to wrap your head around, but take it nice and slow, pause, rewatch if necessary, and by the end of the video you should have a good understanding of how the air flows to create those aerodynamic forces we need for flight. The first tool for describing airflow is to simplify the picture. It's a complex thing, aerodynamics, but if we simplify the picture, we can make it easier for us to understand. So to do that, we will first consider air to be an ideal fluid. What an ideal fluid means is that it is incompressible which essentially means that the density stays constant for that altitude. The second point about an ideal fluid is we consider air to have no viscosity. In actual fact it does, but we're simplifying the picture to make it easier for us to understand. And that essentially means it is free to flow without being too sticky. And the third tool is we're basically thinking of the air as moving rather than the object moving through the air. It just makes the picture a bit simpler for us to understand. The second tool to use to understand an airflow is a way to represent its speed and direction visually. This is where we use streamlines. So streamlines show the flow of air at that exact point on the diagram. So here, our direction is this way, here our direction is this way, and here our direction is this way. So no point in our diagram can have more than one line, as that would mean that point in air is flowing in multiple directions. In essence, this means that streamlines can never cross each other. The spacing of streamlines represents the speed of that flow. The ones that are closer together are traveling faster than the ones far apart and we'll see why a little bit later on in this class. So now we're talking about airflow, let's look about airflow around some objects. So when air encounters an object it will flow around the object smoothly as long as the object is nice and thin and it is presented to the airflow at a very shallow angle. The process of this flowing around is called attachment as it attaches to the surface of the object and flows down it. Initially, it will be a bit rough, but then it will smooth out into laminar flow as we carry on down the length of the object. There are multiple types of airflow, as not all objects are correct to allow this attachment to occur. The first type of airflow is what we just covered, streamline slash laminar flow. It's when everything is very ordered, all the streamlines are very neat and flowing in the same direction. If the object does not fulfill the criteria for attachment and the air separates from the object, it will cause unpredictable flow known as turbulent flow. The conversion from streamline to turbulent flow uses a lot of energy and it is felt as resistance to the direction of flow or drag. The next type of flow to cover is vortex flow. This is very much a three-dimensional type of flow. I've tried to represent that with drawing these axes here. So what happens is the air is forced to rotate around itself in a helix pattern. The conversion from streamline flow to vortex helix flow is a process which requires a lot of energy, which is felt as resistance to the flow or drag. As the helix pattern starts to slow down, it loses energy and starts to spread out, creating your classic vortex shape. 
So now we know a bit about how to describe and draw airflow, let's look at a concept of continuity using Venturi tubes. The concept of continuity is based on the concept that mass slash energy can't be created or destroyed, only converted between different forms. And a Venturi tube is this, it's a tube which thins in the middle. To explain why we care about Venturi and his tubes, we use the mass flow equation, which measures the mass of air passing through a space every second. The mass flow equation is given as mass flow is equal to the area that the air is passing through, the speed that it's passing through, and the density of that air. When we apply mass flow onto our Venturi tube, along with that concept of continuity that mass cannot be created or destroyed, only changed, we see something very interesting. As we have assumed our air to be an ideal fluid and incompressible, that means that the density here remains constant. So the density will be constant in all these different parts here. So we can almost ignore that. That's what we're going to do. Due to the concept of continuity, mass can't be created or destroyed, that means that our mass flow rate must be the same at all points in here. So our mass flow here must equal our mass flow here, which must equal our mass flow here. Okay, so what happens as we go through? If you imagine this as a circular tube, you can imagine the area here is quite large. So our area is large and our speed, whatever speed we're going at. When we get into this middle part here, the area reduces, so the area goes down, which means to maintain that same mass flow, our speed has to increase. And then when we come out, our circular area here would increase and the speed slows down to maintain a constant value for mass flow as we go through the pipe. If you represent the Venturi tube with streamlines, the thinner parts of these stream tubes are equivalent to those thinner parts of the Venturi tubes and they have a higher velocity than the areas with the lines far apart. This is why close together lines on a diagram indicate faster flowing air. So we just looked at how the theory of continuity applies to the mass of an ideal fluid through that Venturi tube. But what happens on the energy side of things? This is where we come to Bernoulli's theorem. Bernoulli's theorem states basically that the sum of the pressure, static pressure in this case, plus the kinetic energy must always remain constant in the flow of an ideal fluid. What in essence does that mean? Well, the kinetic energy is also the same as something called dynamic pressure, which is given the symbol Q. So dynamic pressure is related to the square of the velocity and also the density of that ideal fluid. And then it is multiplied by a constant of a half and we see that static pressure plus a half rho v squared equals constant. Why is this important? Well, let's apply it to our Venturi tube. So when we looked at the Venturi tube before, we were talking about the conservation of mass, the continuity of that mass, meaning that our speed in the middle here had to go up to maintain that constant mass flow rate and then it was reduced either side. If we also apply Bernoulli's theorem that states that the static pressure plus 
the dynamic pressure, half rho V squared equals constant, then it means that as we pass through into the high speed part of the flow, it means that our value here will shoot up. And to keep things constant, our static pressure must decrease to keep the value the same. So as we start here, our static pressure and our dynamic pressure must equal the same the whole way through. And as this is quite low, because of our low speed, our static pressure is quite high. As we come into the next part, our static pressure reduces because our dynamic pressure is increasing because our speed increases and it's a half row V squared. And then as we exit this narrow part of the flow, our static pressure goes back up and our dynamic pressure goes down. So what can we say based off of this? We can simplify it and say that as our speed increases, static pressure decreases. So if we move this principle outside of that venturi tube and observe the effects of a flat plate placed into an airflow, we can see three main principles. First of all, the air is overall deflected downwards due to this plate because the attachment pulls everything down as it goes. And as we see here, the air is closer together. These streamlines are closer together over this part to maintain that mass flow rate, which means that the speed of the air here is higher. And what do we know about high speed air? We know that high speed air means that the static pressure is lower. So it means around here, we have an area of low static pressure. This area of low static pressure is not mirrored on the bottom, meaning there is a difference between the static pressure on top and the static pressure on bottom. The static pressure on the bottom is high when compared to this static pressure on top. And this pressure differential causes a reaction force. This force caused by this differential pressure is felt on our object at 90 degrees to the relative airflow comes off something like this. This plate shape is not a very efficient producer of this force. This plate shape can be further optimized to produce uh, bigger and better areas of low pressure on top and high pressure on the bottom. To do this, you curve the leading edge, you sharpen the trailing edge, you curve the object in between, and you also make the angle to the airflow quite low. This will produce a greater overall area of differential pressure and therefore a greater resulting force. Then you can optimize it one step further into the typical aerofoil shape, which is a cross section of a wing. If you took a slice through a wing, that's what you would call an aerofoil. An aerofoil is a very efficient producer of that lift force while minimizing the drag created by the skin friction and the shape of the object itself. Drag will be covered more in the future, it's a complicated topic, um, but for now we're focusing on the aerofoil and the main parts used to describe it. So first of all, you have a line from the trailing edge, sorry, the leading edge to the trailing edge that goes right through the middle. Oh, that's not very straight. This is called your cord line. The cord of a wing is from the leading edge to the trailing edge, simple as that. Next thing to talk about is the angle of attack. This is the angle between the relative airflow, not the ground, airflow, and the cord of the wing. So it's this angle in here, it's your angle of attack, sometimes given the alpha symbol. 
Next, you have something called the mean camber line. So camber is this curvature on the top, and your mean camber is just sort of your average camber along the way. So it'd be something like that on this wing. That dotted line is your mean camber line. And the last thing to talk about is your thickness to chord ratio. So thickness is just the maximum thickness along the chord. And your thickness to chord ratio is the thickness divided by the chord. So the pressure differential that is creating that reaction force isn't constant around the whole airfoil. And the resulting forces typically look something like this. You have areas where the resultant force is large and you have areas where the resultant force is low. You also have areas right at the start where the air completely stagnates as it hits here creating pressure in the wrong direction. So there's forces going in here. These are drag forces essentially. To change how this pressure distribution map looks and create larger forces here, for example, and lower ones in the areas that are causing drag, we can do a few things. We can change the angle of attack, the camber, and the speed of the airflow. Let's have a quick look out. So speed is the easiest one to talk about. So if we use the dynamic pressure equation, Q equals a half rho V squared. If we increase the speed, then the dynamic pressure will increase. And because the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure always equals a constant, if Q dynamic pressure shoots up, static pressure goes down, which means that there's a bigger difference in between the top and the bottom those forces will therefore be a lot stronger. Increase the speed, you increase the forces that are produced by that airfoil. The next to talk about is camber. So camber feels like it should be fixed by the design of the wing, um, but we can actually change the overall camber of this wing by using flaps. So flaps will droop down off of the back like this and in some aircraft you'll have multiple flaps that droop down like that which means that this overall camber line here is bigger which means that when the airflow comes in it spends longer being deflected and the airflow the streamlines are closer together for a longer period of time than they were before that camber's changed this creates an overall larger area of low static pressure, which means that the resultant forces are larger. Everything just scales up. By manipulating the angle of attack, it's kind of the same principle as camber. We're essentially forcing the streamlines into each other more. We're making the air deflect more. And that means that there's an area here where the static pressure is very low, which means the pressure differential is good, which means the reaction forces are bigger. So in all these cases, there is a large area of low pressure formed and the force produced is spread out across that whole area of low pressure. If we take all these individual forces produced along the airfoil and add them together and place them in the average position, we get a resulting force like this. This force acts through something known as the center of pressure. It is the average position for all these forces. So due to the uneven nature of the forces, the reaction force doesn't act at 90 degrees, 90 degrees to our relative airflow. It's something closer to around 90 degrees off of the cord of the wing, but not exact. And we'll see the reason why 
when we're talking about 3D flow in the future. This resultant force that comes from this pressure differential can be broken down into its component parts due to it being a vector. So if we go straight up vertically, that force there is our lift. And the component that goes back the way, that's our drag. So to summarize, we assume air to be an ideal fluid, which means density is constant. It's incompressible. We also assume air to have no viscosity. And we generally think of air as flowing and the object as being stationary. Something like a wind tunnel. There are three types of flow. We have streamline flow or laminar. We have turbulent and we have vortex. The concept of conservation of mass applied to a venturi tube means that the speed of the air increases when it passes through a smaller gap. So the speed in this small gap is increased. If we then use Bernoulli's theorem, which states that the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure equals a constant, and static pressure is equal to half rho v squared, that means that the air that is flowing faster through here has a higher dynamic pressure and the static pressure is lower. So our static pressure in the fast flowing air decreases. Speed increases, static pressure decreases. Key point. Aerofoils work by creating an area of faster flowing air on top and therefore the static pressure is lower and that pressure differential causes the resultant force. This part here is known as the cord. The angle between the relative airflow and the cord is our angle of attack, sometimes given alpha. The camber is this curvature and we can get the mean camber line, which is basically the average camber. Thickness is the thickest part and from that we can drive a thickness to cord ratio. The pressure differential pattern on top of the wing is not even and the forces are not even that come off of the pressure differential. So our resultant force is the sum of all these in the average position. That average position is known as the center of pressure and the resultant force acts at roughly 90 degrees to the cord line. Not exactly, but we'll cover that in the future. The components of that resultant force can be broken down. The bit that goes vertically is lift and the bit that goes horizontally against the flow of motion is drag.